Laying down ceramic tiles, each measuring 4x4 inches, in a 10x12 kitchen demanded considerable effort. Ronnie Jackson meticulously applied adhesive to each tile before carefully aligning it with the previous one. Ensuring proper alignment, he nodded in satisfaction, recognizing that even minor deviations in millimeters could jeopardize the project's success. Given Eccles' renovation and remodeling's commitment to 100% satisfaction, Ronnie ensured every tile was flawlessly installed before proceeding. Sensing the completion of a row, Charlotte, Ronnie's wife, contacted Eccles on Ronnie's behalf. Answering the call, Ronnie prepared to begin the next row, already reaching for the box of tiles. The days when Charlotte greeted him warmly were gone. Her inquiries had become curt and impatient. Charlotte asked when he would be done. Ronnie assessed his progress and estimated it would take him about three hours in Pritchard's kitchen. After hearing his response, Charlotte ended the call abruptly, leaving Ronnie feeling pressured to hurry up. Despite his eagerness to finish quickly, Ronnie compelled himself to work with deliberate precision. Amidst his tasks, thoughts of his wife, with whom he had shared over two decades, lingered. Ronnie's acquaintance with Charlotte began at Eccles' renovation and remodeling, where he first encountered her during his early days on the job. As Charlotte entered John Eccles' office, apologizing for her academic shortcomings at John W. Dawson High School, Ronnie observed her stout figure and long, wavy hair. Though distracted momentarily, he refocused on the array of hand tools in John's shed, only to be reminded sharply by John that Charlotte was his daughter. Yes, sir, Ronnie responded, resisting the impulse to shrug apathetically. Sensing her father's reluctance for her to engage with his new employee, Charlotte adopted a habit of smiling flirtatiously and greeting Ronnie whenever they crossed paths. Ronnie remained courteous towards her but didn't encourage her attention. You understand, right? John admonished Ronnie. I don't want you chasing after my daughter, got it? I'm not pursuing your daughter, Ronnie replied honestly. In truth, 21-year-old Ronnie found 17-year-old Charlotte Rayner Eccles nothing more than a nuisance. She carried at least 50 extra pounds, struggled with severe acne, and possessed qualities that Ronnie found particularly unattractive. Additionally, he considered Charlotte to be quite immature. Hey, Ronnie, Charlotte said coyly one day as Ronnie and another Eccles employee were unloading their equipment after a long day. Uh-huh, Ronnie said, struggling with an unopened bag of quick-drying cement. Listen, I turn 18 on Saturday, Charlotte leaned forward, granting Ronnie an unhindered sight of her blouse's front. That looks nice, Ronnie remarked. Happy birthday, another co-worker chimed in with a smile. So, Ronnie, what's my birthday present? Charlotte playfully inquired. Mmm, close your eyes, Ronnie proposed, dragging his bag to the pickup truck's rear door. Sure thing, Charlotte giggled. What do you see? Ronnie asked, tossing his bag into the vehicle. Um, nothing, Charlotte replied. This is your gift. Happy birthday, Ronnie announced, dragging the bag of cement towards the barn. Lois Ackles compelled John Ackles to invite Ronnie Jackson to their home for Charlotte's birthday celebration. A medical store in Dolan's, Utah, sold Ronnie a lovely birthday card, while a pawn shop in Fairway, Utah, provided him with a beautiful silver bracelet for $20. Lois pressured John into asking Ronnie to escort Charlotte to the prom. Despite wincing at Charlotte's appearance in a tight sleeveless dress, Ronnie courteously accompanied her, posing for photos, dancing with her, and escorting her home with a goodnight kiss. Days later, John reprimanded Ronnie for Charlotte's heartbreak due to his failure to call her. Despite his reluctance, Ronnie contacted Charlotte and asked her out, leading to subsequent dates. On the fifth date, Charlotte gave Ronnie her pureness. Tracy Lois Jackson was born five months after their wedding, and for the subsequent decade, Ronnie Jackson endured the least desirable assignments at Eccles' renovations and remodeling. Ronnie was convinced that on some occasions, John Eccles deliberately secured jobs for Eccles' renovation and remodeling, just to burden his son-in-law with arduous tasks. Throughout the first 16 years of their marriage, Charlotte Jackson proved to be a devoted wife, striving to understand her husband's preferences and dislikes, mastering his favorite dishes, and observing silence on Sundays during Denver Broncos games. Charlotte also made efforts to lose weight, albeit with fluctuating success. Her skin improved somewhat, but acne scars remained visible, even with the aid of cosmetics. Despite these challenges, when Tracy attended Grover Cleveland Elementary School, Charlotte secured employment at the Garland County Public Library. Despite its modest pay, the comprehensive benefits, including health and dental insurance, made it a valuable opportunity. Right after commemorating their 16th wedding anniversary, 
Charlotte's cousin Darlene relocated to Dolan's, Utah with her third or fourth husband in tow, their whereabouts a mystery. Darlene's boisterous, crude nature was matched by her husband Gary, who was no better, particularly since he was an ardent Dallas Cowboys fan. Unfortunately, Darlene's negative influence rubbed off on Charlotte, who became loud, brash, and prone to complaints, neglecting household duties, including cooking. Despite this, Ronnie, skilled in the kitchen and cleaning, didn't mind the extra workload. However, what was initially occasional slack turned into a nightly occurrence, as Charlotte, Darlene, and Gary often found activities outside the Jackson house. Meanwhile, Tracy learned household chores and sewing buttons on her school uniform, harboring resentment toward her father for her mother's neglect, rather than directing it at her mother. Ronnie's timing was almost impeccable. Three hours after Charlotte's call, he completed the threshold installation. Struggling with stiffness in his back, Ronnie pondered his age while gathering tools and remaining tiles from the Pritchard house. Contacting Joan Eccles, Ronnie winced at the man's slurred speech, a result of a near-fatal blow that left him recovering slowly. John suffered a massive stroke shortly after his wife Lois disclosed her breast cancer diagnosis. Despite Lois's double mastectomy and radiation treatment, she remained burdened with caring for her husband, Dennis Eccles, aided by their sons Brian and Paul, along with Ronnie's assistance when necessary. Charlotte, the family's sole daughter, remained her mother's constant companion, driving her to Fairway Hospital and offering comfort during her moments of pain. Despite Lois's passing, John appeared reluctant to let go of life. Daily, he was wheeled into the office, cursing his useless left hand as he attempted to type on his computer keyboard. Afterwards, Dennis, Brian, or Paul would drive John home. Ronnie informed John over the phone that he was leaving Pritchard's job, and it was finished. John responded with grunts, barks, and wheezes. Back home, Ronnie savored the aroma of his favorite meal, pork chops, mashed potatoes, and French-cut green beans. After John suffered a debilitating stroke, Charlotte put the Jackson family on a heart-healthy diet. Despite losing 40 pounds on the diet, Charlotte remained overweight. Ronnie accused Tracy of going to Brigham Young University solely to avoid Charlotte's bland cooking, a claim Tracy didn't dispute. While Charlotte was busy at the stove, Ronnie leaned in for a kiss, but she waved him away and pinched her nose. Ronnie tossed his clothes into the hamper and washed away the sweat from his tired body. This work was tough enough when he was 21, and at 43, it strained his capabilities and didn't benefit his health. However, Dennis, Brian, and Paul paid no heed to his struggles. With mounting medical bills from John Eccles's rehabilitation, they claimed there was no money in the budget to hire help. Drying himself off, Ronnie ignored the reflection of a fit man in the foggy mirror. Clad in a t-shirt and shorts, he went downstairs just as Charlotte was setting his plate. For dessert, we've got hot apple pie, Charlotte announced, placing a frosted mug and a can of beer before him. Oh my God, Ronnie exclaimed inwardly, feeling bile rise in his stomach. He recalled the last time Charlotte served him frosted beer, enjoying it on her 35th birthday, months before their 17th anniversary. As Tracy was out with friends, Charlotte poured Ronnie a beer in a frosted mug. He savored the taste of the cold drink until Charlotte interrupted, saying, Darling, there's something I need to talk to you about. Ronnie remained silent as Charlotte spoke at length about nothing in particular. Eventually, Ronnie urged her to get to the point, as his beer was almost finished. Charlotte then revealed that Darlene and Gary weren't exclusive. They had an open marriage. She then asked Ronnie if he had ever considered being unfaithful. Indeed, I am a man. Ronnie affirmed. I was eyeing that girl Shelly at the gas station, he confessed. Charlotte retorted, Shelly from the gas station? As if you'd ever stand a chance. But I'm married, Ronnie added. Sure, I look. I think about it, but that's where it ends. Did you think I'd take it further? Charlotte pressed on. Did you believe you could act without facing consequences? I can't, Charlotte, Ronnie stated. We're married. We made vows before our family and friends. Finishing his drink, Ronnie got up, cleaned his mug, and said, We pledge to be faithful, to forsake all others, including Shelley from the gas station. We could renew our vows, Charlotte proposed. No new vows? Ronnie replied firmly, placing the clean mug in the cabinet. Our original vows suffice. While Darlene and Gary may have an open marriage, we don't and never will. But, Charlotte began, No buts. End of discussion, Ronnie cut in, exiting the kitchen. Ronnie hoped that was the end of it. However, Charlotte revisited the topic twice more. Each time, Ronnie firmly declined. But honey, Charlotte persisted, it's a testament to our love. We trust each other enough for this. Annoyed, Ronnie retorted, 
Do you even hear the nonsense you're saying? If you think I should let you cheat to prove my love, maybe I don't love you. Frustrated, when Charlotte mentioned an open marriage for the fourth time, Ronnie called her father. Charlotte watched the phone ring. Hello, John. How are you? Ronnie greeted. Charlotte's expression turned pale, realizing Ronnie was speaking to her father. Adding to her unease, Ronnie asked for Lois. Hey, Lois, Charlotte has something to share with you, Ronnie conveyed. Charlotte, tell your mom about what Darlene told you. Reluctantly, Charlotte took the phone from Ronnie. As she tried to stand from the table, Ronnie, foreseeing her move, firmly restrained her. Feeling cornered, Charlotte rambled incoherently and eventually ended the call. You're despicable, she snapped at Ronnie. Listen, Charlotte, Ronnie warned. Mention this open marriage idea again and our marriage will end. We'll get divorced. Charlotte never raised the topic again. Relieved, Ronnie noticed Darlene and Gary's efforts to reach out diminished. The pair, labeled the toxic twins by Ronnie, visited less frequently. Fast forward five years, Ronnie observed Charlotte pouring his beer, nearly overflowing with foam. She wasn't adept at it. I'll be 40 next Tuesday, Charlotte began as Ronnie tasted his pork chop. Yes, he acknowledged, swallowing. And I was a Vestal when we met, Charlotte added. Turning 40 and being a Vestal, Ronnie remarked, taking another bite. The big four zero, Charlotte emphasized. During all this time, I've only been with one man, luckily for you, Ronnie quipped. You've been with what, at least ten women? Kid Charlotte queried. Is that fair? Life isn't always fair, Ronnie responded, sipping his beer. Considering my upcoming birthday and all I've done for you, Tracy, and my parents, I think I deserve some freedom. Darlene and I are heading to Las Vegas next week. She found a good deal at a casino, Charlotte shared. Ronnie continued eating and drinking. While there, we might meet some guys, Charlotte proposed. Not necessarily for anything serious, just a date. Let me see what it's like with someone else. It might make me value what I have even more, she said. The sauce is almost perfect, Ronnie commented. What's your take, Charlotte inquired. I've told you, the sauce is nearly spot on, Ronnie responded. Charlotte, this is about me branching out, gaining experience, Charlotte retorted. So, you're suggesting I'm being unfaithful, Ronnie questioned. I've made up my mind, Charlotte asserted. You can either support me or opt for a divorce. Your choice. I'll initiate the divorce, Ronnie stated. Do we have any ice cream for this pie? Hold on, Charlotte. Divorces cost a fortune. We can't just brush that aside, Ronnie exclaimed, surprised. What's there to discuss? You've clearly decided everything. You and your dubious cousin are heading to Vegas. You're not asking. You've already chosen Vegas. Forget our massive pile of bills here. You're off to Vegas for your Big Four celebration. And while you're at it, maybe a date? Even though you're married, you think that's okay? I either support your plan or face divorce? Ronnie said, pushing his empty plate away. Does this pie come with ice cream? It's just for one week, Charlotte defended. A week, a day, a minute. It doesn't change anything, Charlotte, Ronnie responded, slicing a piece of pie. Infidelity is infidelity, and I won't be married to a cheater. So, no, no ice cream. Maybe you can take Darlene, Charlotte proposed. Absolutely not, Ronnie chuckled. Charlotte, I wouldn't be with Darlene if she were the last person on earth. Ronnie tasted the pie, frowned in distaste, and said, Oh, wonderful. You used that aspartame stuff, didn't you? Pushing his plate away. Standing up, Ronnie wiped his mouth, exiting the kitchen. I'm seeing a lawyer tomorrow to start the divorce process, Ronnie declared, heading upstairs. Pritchard's job was done, and Dennis wasn't planning anything until he got the green light to rebuild the federal savings and loan. But Ronnie... You never listen, Charlotte interjected. Sure, Ronnie yelled from downstairs. You never heard me. I told you the consequences if you brought this up again. We're getting divorced. In their third bedroom turned home office, Ronnie powered up the computer. Though outdated, it still functioned and had internet access. After entering a search, Ronnie began looking for lawyers. He found Penny Barnes's online form and completed it. Shortly after, he received a call confirming an appointment with Penny Barnes. The next morning at 10, after Charlotte cleaned the kitchen, she went upstairs. Undressing, she got into bed undressed. When Charlotte pressed against him, Ronnie pulled away. No thanks, he said, turning away. Good night. Ronnie woke up at his regular time, 5.30 in the morning. Even though he didn't have work, he still rose at his customary hour. Quietly, he left the bed and softly closed their bedroom door. Descending to the kitchen, he brewed coffee and checked his email on his cell phone. 
An email from Penny Barnes' office detailed what he should bring to the seven o'clock meeting. Ronnie debated having a second cup of coffee. Hearing Charlotte moving around upstairs, he chose not to make coffee for her. If she wanted some, she could make it herself. No, no, I told him, give it to me. Charlotte's voice came from her cell phone as she descended the stairs. Spotting Ronnie calmly reading news on his phone, she let out a shriek. She quickly ended her call and pocketed her phone. Ronnie, what are you doing here? Charlotte inquired. I mentioned Dennis hasn't received approval to start rebuilding the federal savings and loan, so I'm free today, Ronnie replied. The grass is too damp to mow, so I caught up on today's news. Did you hear Burns and Burns is considering a second location? You could have saved me some coffee, Charlotte complained. You can ask Darlene to make you some, Ronnie replied, placing his cup in the sink. Penny Barnes, an attractive brunette, wore glasses that Ronnie suspected were just for show, to appear more intellectual and serious. Hmm, Penny remarked, examining their financial documents. You recently refinanced at 3.9%? My daughter's in her final year, Ronnie explained. Plus, my in-laws had hefty medical bills. Their deductibles were sky high, then funeral costs. And Eccles was nearly bankrupt. A couple of projects went over budget because Paul failed to time the orders right. Yes, Penny nodded, reading on. So, Mr. Jackson, how will divorcing your employer's daughter impact your job? I plan to end the relationship, Ronnie responded, a hint of a smile appearing. But Mrs. Jackson's position at the Garland County Public Library shouldn't be jeopardized, Penny speculated. By Friday, Dennis still hadn't gotten the go-ahead for the federal savings and loan renovations. Ronnie was at home completing renovations when Charlotte called. What's this? What kind of scam? Charlotte yelled as Ronnie picked up. Oh, you have the documents, Ronnie remarked. What's the issue with the first floor bathroom? You mentioned something needs fixing, but honestly, I can't figure out the problem, Ronnie asked. And the lock is sticking, Charlotte replied. We'll need to discuss this when I get home, all right? No, we've already had that discussion. Talking hasn't helped, especially when you seem more inclined to heed Darlene over your own husband. So I'm done talking, Ronnie stated firmly. All right, I see what's going on. Got it. Goodbye. But I don't want a divorce, Charlotte lamented. And I don't want to be married to an unfaithful person, Ronnie shot back. Anything else? No. Goodbye then. Ronnie declined Charlotte's subsequent call. When John's number flashed on the screen, Ronnie set down his screwdriver and answered. Hello? Ronnie greeted. John erupted with a mix of frustrated sounds and exclamations. Ronnie was surprised at the range of swear words he could discern as his father-in-law pressed for details about Ronnie and Charlotte. It's pretty straightforward, sir, Ronnie began. Darlene and her spouse practice an open marriage, and they influence Charlotte to consider it too. I made it clear I'm not interested in that. Amidst another emotional outburst from John, Ronnie continued, Your daughter gave me an ultimatum last night, accepted or divorce. So, I chose divorce. John attempted to argue further, even resorting to emotional manipulation. Sir, I appreciate your concern, Ronnie fibbed. But with three sons and a daughter... This issue should be handled by them, not me. Besides, why would I want a business that's been losing money for three years? Ronnie muttered to himself. Charlotte returned home with reinforcements. Ronnie anticipated this and remained silent as Darlene and Gary voiced their perspectives. You see, Ronnie, since we're secure in our marriage, Gary smirked, Darlene can maintain friendships outside of it. I mean, as long as she returns to me, right? Darlene added. And we share everything. No secrets. It's brought us closer. Well... That certainly brings clarity, Ronnie remarked. Charlotte, Darlene, and Gary smiled in response. Actually, Ronnie corrected, rising from the couch. After our divorce, Charlotte, feel free to share your life and inner world with whomever you choose. Oh, what's this? Gary smirked. So just because you feel inadequate, Charlotte should suppress her own talents and desires? Ronnie flashed a grin, revealing all his teeth. He then strolled to the living room exit, facing the stairs. If believing that makes you feel better, go right ahead. Ronnie said, departing the room once more. That night, Charlotte attempted to initiate closeness. Rest up, Charlotte. You've got a busy day ahead, don't you? Ronnie said with a grin. As was his routine, Ronnie woke at 5.30 and left the bed. He no longer concerned himself with closing their bedroom door, indifferent to whether his early movements disturbed Charlotte. Descending the stairs, he brewed coffee, sipped it while perusing the news on his phone, and found himself scoffing at national headlines. These politicians really should live by their own standards. Lifetime perks? Forget it. Try living on Social Security. Private health care? Nope. Here's the same insurance they've mandated for everyone else. At 11, 
Gary knocked on the door. Ronnie answered, and Gary attempted to enter. Ronnie's firm hand halted Gary's eager advance. What's up? Ronnie inquired. I'm here to pick up Charlotte for the airport, Gary explained, making another attempt to enter. I'll inform her you're here, Ronnie said, nudging Gary back and shutting the door, returning to his recorded sitcom. Shortly after, Charlotte descended the stairs with her suitcase. Why didn't you tell me Gary and Darlene were waiting outside? She demanded of Ronnie. Oh, right. Gary and Darlene are here, Ronnie replied, refocusing on his show. Seriously? Must you act so immaturely? Charlotte exclaimed. As she leaned in towards Ronnie, he sidestepped, leaving her to kiss the empty air. We'll discuss this when I return, Charlotte stated. No, we won't be doing that, Ronnie responded. After watching his sitcom and enjoying a satisfying meal, Ronnie finished his tasks by painting the front door a pale yellow. It complemented the house's red brick exterior beautifully. He chuckled when their cat Samson meowed from the garage. Samson was well provided for with food, water, and a clean litter box. I'll let you out once the paint dries, buddy, Ronnie assured the cat. Upstairs, he canceled their shared credit cards. He wasn't aware of any cards Charlotte had separately and had no intention of supporting her indiscretions or her cousin's lavish lifestyle. He accessed Charlotte's personal bank account and withdrew half the balance. Similarly, he withdrew half from their joint account, from which he was the sole contributor. Utilizing the bank's website, he opened a new account solely in his name and transferred the withdrawn funds there. Online services facilitated the removal of his name from utilities and cable TV. He shrugged off an email from Garland County Power and Light, stating the cancellation would occur at the billing cycle's end. Doesn't matter, Ronnie commented to the screen. Time for Sloan's Pizza, Ronnie thought as his stomach rumbled. Charlotte never let me eat there. Maybe I'll drop dead from a heart attack. He ordered pizza and a draft beer. He flirted with the waitress, even though she was significantly overweight. She smiled, tapping his wedding ring with her long nail. Ronnie glanced at the ring, his mood souring. He thanked her, left a tip in his truck, and departed. After considerable effort, Ronnie removed the ring, placing it in the console cup holder. Forever love, huh, Charlotte? He mused aloud. Guess that ended today. His truck signaled low fuel. At the gas station, he initially chose $10 worth, but decided to fill the tank completely. Filling 22 gallons sure takes time, Ronnie commented as the pump continued to gurgle. He visited a nearby convenience store and found Budweiser beer. While walking past another set of refrigerators, he noticed containers of ice cream. He picked up a pint of strawberry ice cream and brought both items to the counter. Shelly was no longer working there. She had gotten married, much to the disappointment of Ronnie and many other men who frequented that gas station, just to see her behind the counter. However, Shannon Carlyle, a petite brunette now working there, was almost as attractive as Shelley. Ronnie grinned as Shannon stepped onto a milk crate she had placed by the cash register. On a previous occasion, he had asked her height, to which she sharply responded, I'm four feet eight inches tall. How short are you? Ronnie quipped. Her eyes widened momentarily, then she burst into hearty laughter, brightening her already pretty face. From then on, she affectionately referred to Ronnie as Shorty. Your wife out of town, Shorty? Shannon inquired, observing his purchases. My wife is gone for good, Ronnie replied. Shannon glanced at Ronnie's left hand, then met his eyes. After studying his face briefly, she asked, So where are you taking me on our first date? Brushing her thick brown hair back with her hand. Shannon, as lovely as you are, why would you want to date an old guy like me? Ronnie questioned. That's about seven inches, Shannon remarked, bagging Ronnie's items. Charlotte's 40th birthday was on Tuesday. On Wednesday, their daughter Tracy called Ronnie. Ackley's renovation and remodeling, Ronnie answered. Dad, yesterday was Mom's birthday, Tracy informed him. Yeah, so, Ronnie responded, scratching his stubbled face. Why didn't you call her? Tracy pressed. I didn't want this, Ronnie sighed. I just didn't, kiddo. Why? Tracy persisted. You'll understand soon, Ronnie replied. Your mother believes that now that she's 40, she should be with other men. What? Tracy exclaimed. What do they teach you in school? Ronnie retorted. She's married. Married women don't date other men, Tracy clarified. Oh, that's so old-fashioned, Tracy laughed. Goodbye, Tracy, Ronnie said, ending the call. Ten minutes later, Charlotte's number appeared on Ronnie's phone. Despite recognizing the caller, he answered, Eckley's renovation and remodeling. Hi, Ronnie, Charlotte greeted firmly. So, how's being a 40-year-old? Ronnie quipped. This isn't a joke, Ronnie, Charlotte snapped. I agree, it's not funny, Ronnie conceded. And thanks for canceling the credit cards, Charlotte added. 
You're welcome, Ronnie responded. Anything else? My birthday was yesterday, Charlotte mentioned. Why didn't you call? Ronnie questioned. I didn't want this. Maybe whoever you're with would have wished you, Ronnie suggested. Grow up, Ronnie, Charlotte retorted. Really, Charlotte? Adults honor their commitments and respect their vows, Ronnie stated. Who's Melissa Kalick? Charlotte inquired. Remember Melissa Strom? She married Lucy Kalick, the bank manager, Ronnie clarified. Regardless, she's employed at Gold Standard Real Estate now. I've got this adorable redhead. She's as charming as can be. On the bright side, she believes she can quickly find a buyer for our house, Ronnie shared. Buyer? Ronnie, we aren't selling the house, Charlotte exclaimed over the phone. Can you really afford to surprise me like this? We have to settle the second mortgage, as Melissa informed me. She might find a buyer, but we'll likely need to bring cash to clear that mortgage, Ronnie replied. We're not selling the house, Charlotte reiterated loudly. I've stored all your furniture at the EZ Warehouse on Independence Road, next to Chevrolet Place, Ronnie added. Unit 212. Your dad has the key. Oh, Lord, Ronnie, I need to get home. Charlotte's voice was filled with distress. Your dad couldn't fetch Samson, so I took him to Dennis's, Ronnie continued. Dennis? Oh, God, Dennis has those Dobermans, Charlotte exclaimed in terror. Ah, uh, shoot, I didn't consider that, Ronnie chuckled. No wonder he was keen on adopting that cat. Ignoring his wife's pleas, Ronnie ended the call. Leaving the phone on the kitchen counter, he headed upstairs to surf the internet. He heard his cell phone ring, but chose to ignore it. And maybe your mom's new boyfriend can cover his final school year, Ronnie muttered. Why don't you check for a scholarship for students with a GPA of 2.1? Because with that attitude, it's tough to expect your dad to finance your education, he retorted. After shutting down the computer, Ronnie shaved, removing three days of stubble carefully. He then took a hot shower, got dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. The computer was in the pickup truck's cab, behind the passenger seat. As his final act... Ronnie discarded his cell phone in the trash and wheeled the trash can to the curb. Going to miss you, Herman Vogart, a neighbor, greeted Ronnie on the street. Vogart, you won't do this, Ronnie laughed, shaking Herman's hand. The most we spoke was when you griped about Tracy's boys blasting their music. It's tough getting neighbors to give you space. Ah, oh, man, Herman sighed. You were the ideal neighbor. Never borrowed stuff, never asked me to feed your cat or collect your mail during vacations. I bet the next folks will be all over me. You brought it on yourself being so friendly, Ronnie remarked. The trash can's ringing, Herman pointed out. Mind your business. It's probably some critter, Ronnie smirked, shaking Herman's hand again. Charlotte tried unlocking the front door but found her key didn't fit. She pulled out her phone, dialed the number for gold standard real estate listed on the sign, and stared at it in disbelief. Her phone was fully charged, but it seemed faulty. Darlene lent Charlotte her cell while Gary checked the house's windows and doors. Charlotte whispered curses when the call connected. Gold Standard Real Estate, Melissa Kalick speaking, Melissa greeted cheerfully. This is Charlotte Jackson, Charlotte snapped. My key doesn't work at my house. Ah, Ronald Jackson's ex, Melissa chirped. Ex, ex, Charlotte retorted. I need to sign some paperwork, Melissa continued. Guess what? I have clients interested in your home. It's not for sale, Charlotte exclaimed. So, are you buying out Mr. Jackson? Melissa probed. The Richmonds might be disappointed. They liked the Purcell house, too. Gary returned, confirming the house was secure. Charlotte reiterated the house wasn't for sale and called Ronnie. You idiot, Charlotte muttered as Ronnie's voice answered. Eccles renovations and remodeling. Can we drop you somewhere? Gary interrupted, growing impatient. My cat, Charlotte remembered, squeezing back into the car. Hey, Dennis answered. It's me, Ronnie said. He gave Samson to you? Charlotte asked. With poppy, olive oil, and blue tool around? They'd shred that cat, Dennis snapped. No, Dad has him. You need to get him. Dad's physical therapist is allergic. Thank goodness, Charlotte sighed. Thanks, Dennis continued. Ronnie's disappearance almost bankrupted us. I secured a federal loan but had to let Fremonte take it because none of us can lay ceramic tile. Uh-huh, Charlotte interrupted. Who else are you calling? Darlene snapped as Charlotte dialed her dad's number. Don't you have unlimited? Charlotte asked. Nope, 1,000 minutes monthly. Mr. Football used most, Darlene replied. Last call, Charlotte assured. John angrily agreed to let her come over. Gary drove them to John Eccles' house. Darlene and Charlotte hugged, and Charlotte headed inside. How was it? Gary asked Darlene as she got in the car. Disastrous, Darlene sighed. Who'd want her? Not with you around, Gary joked, watching Charlotte enter. 
Any money from her? Darlene inquired. Almost, Gary said, pulling out. Ronnie's such a pain. Can you hear me? Darlene sounded frustrated. He canceled her credit cards. She used her debit, Gary explained. ATMs are everywhere, Darlene pointed out. She got about ten dollars, Gary muttered. We need gas, Darlene stated. With ATMs and the internet, she's fine, Gary reasoned. Unless your football-obsessed hubby isn't hogging minutes, Darlene retorted. Here's twenty dollars, Gary handed Darlene. She went online, Darlene concluded. What's the connection to ATMs? Gary inquired as he steered into the gas station. Charlotte noticed Ronnie covered half her bill. Just grab ten dollars, all right? We still have the electricity bill to cover unless you've settled it already, Darlene suggested. Gary nodded and entered the adjoining convenience store. Darlene observed Gary glance at the beer cooler and then honk the car horn. Gary shot her a disapproving look through the store's window, but proceeded to the counter. I was only getting one can, Gary claimed upon his return. Just one? Darlene retorted. When was the last time you settled for just one can? Gary mumbled. Hey, isn't that petite lady new here? How come she has such prominent chest? Gary commented. She's petite, so her chest seem larger in comparison, Darlene corrected. Let's get that gas, Gary urged. Fine, Darlene responded reluctantly. Amidst their argument, Charlotte endured her father's furious monologue. Since his stroke, John's language has become increasingly crude and he didn't shy away from using derogatory and harmful words to describe those around him. When was the last time you looked in the mirror? John questioned. Fat pig. That face looks like it was doused and saved with an ice pick, John went on. Dad, Charlotte exclaimed, deeply hurt. Turning 40? So what? Women hit 40 every day, John grumbled but not all betray their family at 40. John gestured towards legal documents on the coffee table. Just then, Samson entered the room. You'll need a lawyer, and I have to clean that cat litter box, John snapped. Good Lord. I don't know what that animal eats, but it stinks to high heaven, John muttered. You're back in your old room, John said tersely. I hope betraying us was worth it. Do you hear me? I hope it was. Forty years old and still making foolish choices. Later that night, Lying in her childhood bed, Charlotte gazed at the wallpaper she and her mother had chosen when she was eight. Samson remained still as Charlotte switched off the light, staring into the darkness. The week of her 40th birthday had begun on a high note. The flight to Vegas was smooth, Charlotte recalled, watching the city lights emerge below. After checking into their hotel, Charlotte and Darlene tried their luck at the roulette table before opting for dinner. Charlotte felt humiliated when a waiter informed her her credit card was declined. The second met the same fate. The manager brought out her third card with a stern expression. Charlotte tried her debit card, which thankfully went through. Upon checking her bank, she discovered her balance had been halved. Both she and Darlene blamed Ronnie Jackson, feeling he had overstepped, way overstepped. Come on, Darlene, Darlene urged. We're in Vegas. We can't let this setback spoil our fun, right? However, watching Darlene lose $300 at the blackjack table dimmed the evening's excitement a bit. That was Charlotte's $300, Darlene muttered. Charlotte struck up a conversation with a handsome young man at a bar, 25-year-old David Daltrey, and they headed to her room. It was a brief four minutes, Charlotte, Darlene quipped. Charlotte caught David attempting to snatch her wallet from her purse. Darlene lamented her $100 daily limit. Lady Luck wasn't on Darlene's side this trip. Charlotte joked. Darlene's $100 seemed to vanish as soon as she left the hotel room. On Tuesday evening, my birthday, I approached another young man, Charlotte remembered. He smirked and said, Lady, if I wanted closeness with a 300-pound woman, I'd be home with my wife. He then suggested a blind convention nearby, mocking my appearance. Feeling hurt, Charlotte took the elevator to their room. Seeing the Do Not Disturb sign, she groaned and spent hours in the lobby coffee shop. Eventually, she messaged Darlene about returning. Back in her room after a shower, Charlotte wore hot lingerie and lay in bed staring at the ceiling. She noticed Ronnie hadn't called or texted for her birthday. Tracy didn't call either, but sent a birthday text. Checking her phone, Charlotte felt the sting of her husband's neglect. Yet she appreciated birthday wishes from Dennis, Brian, and Paul. The next morning, Darlene grumbled about the budget, hinting she paid for their flight and hotel. By Saturday, Charlotte contemplated ending her relationship with Darlene due to her constant complaints. But with Darlene holding their airline tickets, Charlotte stayed quiet. Now in her childhood room, Charlotte sighed deeply. Her birthday month was far from a celebration. Jim Runkles, recommended by Freddie Baxter from the Garland County Public Library, reviewed the papers from Penny Barnes's office. He then delivered a blunt assessment. 
He gets half, you get half. The house must be sold, with profits split evenly. Expenses are shared. Despite his unemployment, he isn't seeking child support, Jim stated. But I don't want a divorce, Charlotte protested. I don't want to lose my home. I don't want to miss Jackson. It doesn't change the facts, Jim responded. One person wants a divorce, and that can lead to it. Can we get a consultation? Charlotte asked. We can request one, Jim confirmed, and Charlotte smiled. I'll call Penny's office. Listening to Jim, Charlotte glanced at his book titles, hearing mostly uh-huh and hmm from him. All right, Mrs. Jackson, here's the issue, Jim stated, setting his phone on the table. I'm paying you to avoid issues, Charlotte responded, gripping her purse firmly. Miss Barnes doesn't know where her client is. Your husband came, settled her fee, and departed, Jim relayed. She only possesses his email address. Is that essential? It's her sole means to reach him. And no, she won't disclose the email. It's protected by attorney-client privilege, Jim clarified. Oh, Charlotte murmured, settling back in her chair. Ronnie informed Miss Barnes that henceforth your daughter will cover her tuition and dorm costs, Jim added. He mentioned something about initiating new traditions. Do you grasp what he's implying? Charlotte inquired. No, Charlotte whispered. But I suspect Tracy might. Charlotte bypassed her 41st birthday, dressing for work and leaving her room. John remained absorbed, hands limp on his lap, when his daughter planted a kiss on his cheek. Anything you need before I head out? Charlotte queried. No, John mumbled. All right, I'll depart. Take care of Samson, all right? Charlotte endeavored to inject cheer into her voice. Everything's fine. My two main guys will be good. Got it? John responded, his words interspersed with grunts and barks. Charlotte commuted to work, following her familiar route from her dad's residence to the library. Her phone buzzed, but she waited until parking to check. Happy birthday, flashed on her screen. Thanks, Tracy, Charlotte responded flatly. Thrilled for my birthday, just brimming with joy. Still, she acknowledged Tracy's greeting. Despite shedding 25 pounds since turning 40, Charlotte's transformation went unnoticed. She felt overlooked since Ronnie's departure. Shortly after Ronnie exited, Charlotte discerned the nature of Darlene and Gary's open marriage. Financial constraints bound them, leading to a loveless coexistence in a trailer as mere roommates. Darlene and Gary lacked affectionate gestures. Charlotte recalled Ronnie's warmth and kisses, especially after she cooked him a meal. However, after announcing her solo Vegas trip for her 40th, Ronnie's affection waned. Their last encounter ended with Ronnie evading her kiss. An hour post Tracy's text, Charlotte's phone rang. Reading a message from her boss questioning her tardiness, she disembarked from her car, dazed, and approached her workplace's rear entrance. Tracy received a thank-you text from her mom for the birthday wishes, followed by a picture of a brown-haired little girl gazing back at her. Antoinette Barbara Jackson, weighing 6 pounds, 4 ounces, and measuring 17 inches, checked a text from her father's phone. Tracy found it ironic that her mom and younger sister shared a birthday. She doubted her mom would see the humor, or if her dad even remembered. Is this Shannon Parquet? Becky McMahon here, a brunette stated over the phone. We offer carpets, tiles, hardwoods, and laminate flooring. Hey, Shorty, a voice teased on the line. Pardon me, Ronnie Jackson told a couple choosing hardwood floor colors. He signaled Bobby to assist them and picked up the call. The man nodded and approached the couple. Ronnie moved to the wall phone and answered the blinking line. Scanning the trading floor, he listened attentively. He awaited news from Samuel D. about securing an exclusive flooring contract for the developer's projects. Listening, Shorty, Ronnie greeted. Guess what, Mr. Shorty, Shannon's voice teased. Looks like you and your seven inches are making me a mom again. Shannon, really? Ronnie exclaimed in surprise. Tony's still in diapers and we're expecting another? Shannon giggled on the other end. Where are you? Ronnie asked. Just left Dr. Pruitt's, Shannon replied. Hurry over, Ronnie urged. We're celebrating at the Stone Grill. All this talk about my figure is why we're in this situation, Shannon chuckled, pushing Tony's stroller from Alliance Square Medical Center into the Texas heat. At four foot eight, she brushed her hair back and scanned her surroundings, always cautious due to her height. She faced the sun and smiled. When Ronnie told Shannon Carlisle he was leaving the gas station, she questioned his destination. Ronnie paused. Why? he asked. So I can forward my last paycheck, Shannon quipped, stepping off her milk crate. Heading somewhere warm? I'm already snowed in. Shannon, what's a stunning girl like you doing with an old guy like me? Ronnie teased. Ready to banter back, Shannon replied, about seven inches. Closing her eyes, she asked, 
What color are my eyes? Dark brown, Ronnie answered. I have a dimple. On which side? She queried, opening her eyes. Left, he responded. And when you smile, your right front tooth peeks out, slightly crooked, he added. Why say goodbye? Shannon questioned, moving from the counter. Polly, I'm leaving. I'm not sure, Ronnie said as Polly, hauling his three twelve pounds, exited the warehouse. Sure, Shannon grinned, taking Ronnie's hand. Polly, I'm out. Two hours left, Polly protested. Feeling sick? Shannon claimed. Goodbye. Ever been to Texas? Outside Alliance Square Medical Center, Shannon whispered, Ronnie, I love you.